Coming to you live from Radio Canaan Studio. For the record. For the record. For the record. Here, Here from, from your, your government, government officials, officials, independents, and the opposition on issues that matter to you. For the record. Engage in an open dialogue between residents and lawmakers. For the record. For the record. For the record. Informative, impartial, insightful. This is your talk show. 1 800 534 8255. Your calls, your input. This is For the Record. And now, your host, Arit Connor. Good morning and welcome to For the Record. Today is Wednesday, the 23rd day of May 2018. It's been quite a while since For the Record has been on live. Uh, this is the first show since last week, Friday. I trust that uh, everyone had an enjoyable evening. We're continuing. Uh, we got quite a bit of rain over the past few days. Welcomed as well. Uh, I'm sure that the the trees, uh, you know, all of the vegetation, they're all smiling as a result of that. I'm sure that those uh, persons who are in the um, landscaping business, lawn care, they're probably smiling too because it means that the grass will be growing and uh, as a result, their services will be in demand. I'm sure that the crabs are smiling also because they will now start coming out of their holes and then the human beings will also be uh, happy as well because they will be right there waiting to catch the crabs. And while I'm on the note of crabs, I just want to caution all of those of you who engage in catching crabs. If you're on the roads catching crabs, please, please be extremely careful. Ensure that you well lit, you have flashlights, you don't wear dark clothing, you want to have light colored clothing, if possible, reflective clothing as well. When you're parking your vehicles on the side of the road, ensure that they're off uh, from the roadway itself so that they do not impede traffic, do not create situations uh, to cause accidents as well. So urging you to be extremely careful. Those of you who are driving on the roads, be extremely careful as well. If it is raining and there is inclement weather, unless you absolutely have to be on the roads, don't go out there. Stay home, stay inside. Uh, chances of you getting into an accident if you're at home, I, I believe I can safely say the ch chances of an uh, automobile accident are virtually nil, Z zero percentage chance of that happening to you. So please be extremely careful on the roads, whatever you do. Folks, I want to thank you for listening and viewing audience for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles, as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. Of course, For the Record is a show produced by the staff and management of Radio Cayman, and it is geared towards keeping you abreast of issues as they arise and play out on the local, regional, and international scene. I am your host, Orit Connor, and you're welcome to join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 7.30 a.m. until 9.30 a.m. Our phone lines are always open, and there is always someone there waiting to take your calls. Nine times out of ten is that beautiful radio voice of Miss Susan Watson. Uh, she's the one who's playing all of that nice gospel music uh, before the 7 o'clock news uh, as well. From 6 to 6.30, she is playing that nice gospel music. This morning, it was really, 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 really jumping and exciting. I enjoyed it on my way down as well. And when I got into the studio, she was really animated about it as well. You should have seen her. It's a pity we didn't have the camera in the, <laughs> in the studio at that time. So if you want to join us in the conversation, you can call us on our toll-free number provided courtesy of Flow. That toll-free number is 1-800-534-8255. You can also call us on 949-8037 and 949-6990. Of course, if you don't like to talk on the telephone, you can email us at For the Record. That is one word for the record at C-A-N-D-W dot K-Y. And we also have our WhatsApp number. That number is 925 three two six one where we encourage you 
to send us a text message or leave us a voice note. If you leave a voice note, then the contents of that voice note will be played during the course of the show as well. Today being Wednesday, it is one of the Wednesdays that has been set aside for the independent member of our Legislative Assembly, Mr. Kenneth Bryan, to be on the show. I want to welcome Mr. Bryan this morning, uh, and I will ask him to introduce his guest who he has brought with him as well. Mr. Bryan, good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. Good morning, Mr. Connor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be on the radio with you and to um, share information and discussion with the listening audience of Radio Cayman and For the Record. Uh, this morning, I have with me no stranger to the airways, no strangers to, to anybody here in the Cayman Islands, the Honorable Mr. Gilbert McLean. Um, and the reason why I have him here this morning as uh, a guest of mine is because we're going to be talking about some things um, about what needs to happen moving forward in the Cayman Islands. And I know that he has a rather um, straight and uh, informative viewpoint that quite similar to mine in respect to some of the things that need to do, be done moving forward as a result of the recent information that came out of the UK or with the decisions of Parliament and the House of Commons. So I, I asked him to, to come along. I, I know that his views are, uh, him and I share a lot of views in respect to some of the topics I think that, that the country needs to be focused on. So his input would have been um, so beneficial to, to the discussion and to the Cayman Islands. So I, I'll allow him to introduce himself again, though he's no stranger. Morning, Mr. McLean. Welcome to For the Record, sir. Uh, good morning, O.C. Uh, it's good to see you. Good to be here in the studio with you. And uh, I'd like to say good morning to your listening audience and to thank uh, Mr. Brian for inviting me here today to uh, sit and uh, take part in the discussion which is going to follow. Okay. So uh, we're going to follow your agenda this morning, Mr. Brian, and uh, we want to... Uh, Pass the mic over to you. All right. Get, All right. Get the ball rolling. Uh, for some reason there, I thought I was going to. Um, we were going to get a, um, a break before I had to jump <laughs> in, but it's okay. Um, before we get into the to the um, um, crux of what I, I plan to talk about this morning, I just wanted to uh, highlight uh, some safety elements with the rain, and then go into the seriousness of the conversation. Yeah. And it would be useful also if you could point it because I know some of your constituents um, uh, live in low lying yes, areas. Yes. And whether or not. Uh, the uh, rains have affected them. I notice in areas where you would normally see water settling, you're not seeing too much of it, and that is because it has been so dry yes, prior, to, prior yes, to the rain, yes. so the grounds haven't gotten saturated yet. And yes. I want you to talk about any experiences that your constituents, your constituents may have had mm. in those low-lying areas. Well, well, well thank you again, O.C. Uh, I would like to also not only give the credit to the, the dryness, but also to the NRA. I had the opportunity to meet with them just a Wednesday, a t Tuesday, two weeks ago, um, obviously trying to prepare for the rainy season. And, and as you highlighted just now, there's many of my constituents that do live in low-lying areas. So preparation is the best thing to do in respect to the rain. So I met with the NRA uh, and we discussed all the um, the drain holes that are in my uh, constituency and try to have make or try to make sure that there's a schedule for them to be blown out before the rain came, because sometimes what will happen is they'll get blocked up and the rain comes and then we have to blow them out when the rain is already there and creates the flooding. So I, I must give them a big thanks there at NRA and the new acting director is doing such a great job. Uh, I must give him credit. Um, when I sat with him and his team, he was so um, helpful in respect to allow me to, to get my job done in respect to looking out for my constituents. So, um, acting director, Mr. Um, I, no, uh, his name uh, slips, <laughs> slips me right now. I really don't want to okay. mess sorry, that sorry up. For so you on the <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, um, but I give not much respect to him. All the same. Um, so most of those holes were blown out, if not every single one of them. Uh, I spent the whole day yesterday going through my constituency: Palmdale, Tropical Gardens, Ryan Road, Crew Road, um, Georgetown Central, Martin Drive, Scranton, North Sound Road, up on um, Bre Breezy Castle Way. And I, I took a really good look at um, the areas that were low-lined, and, and the drains are running smoothly. Um, 
but but to continue that process, I want to give a little bit of um, dream education, if I can. Um, I'd hope to have one of the NRA representatives with me at some stage to give more practical information about it, but I'll give you what I know. Okay. Um, some of the times why the, the drainage don't work is because of blockage. Um, obviously everybody has trees in the yards and sometimes even litter with the rain can be um, float, floated in from somewhere else or, or comes with the water. Um, and it's important that um, if you have a drain on your street or potentially even in your yard to if you hear rains are coming, take a look around the area, see and, and make sure that the drains are not blocked in any capacity. Make sure there's no big items there to, to stop the water from flowing in there. Um, if you are a strappy person, or pretty strong, or if you have some good able-bodied young persons in the area, um, sometimes even within the drain itself, we know that those drains have big metal um, grills. grills there. If somebody is willing, and do you take this on your own risk because I don't want to be liable for anybody uh, if they do it, but if you are willing to do it on your own risk, you can sometimes take a look at that, take the grill off, take a look inside there, make sure there's no debris in there that's blocking the passage of water to flow through. Um, so bottom line is to, to keep maintenance of your drains in your area to make sure that they're clear of any debris so the water can flow well. Um, I've even seen yesterday where um, there was uh, two particular areas in my constituent in my constituency where constituents made a makeshift kind of um, blockage from debris because where, where the drain was there's a lot of trees and stuff so they put some blocks around the drain um, to stop any like coconuts or leaves or anything going down there and it worked perfectly fine and the water was flowing quite well because sometimes the drain is so low in a low line area it's hard to stop things from getting to the drain so just put a little something around it so they can stop any debris from going in there but just be mindful of that and I want to take this opportunity to um, let persons know that if in fact some of the drains do not work um, as they're supposed to there is a number to call um, in case of an emergency and and the drains are not working or operating appropriately just give me two seconds to to just find that and I can hand it out to the to the to the persons who are listening so here we go um, the emergency number particularly for my constituency um, is five two five one two five one again that number is five two five one two five one and that's if the drains in your area are not working appropriately um, somebody will come down and and take a look at it and see if it's blocked and it's blown out or what have you uh, it's important that we prepare ourselves because we know the severity of water damage can be done to a home um, and if we prepare ourselves beforehand and, and try to avoid that then we would have less um, need uh, uh, of services or help from 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 each other so I just want to remind people of that and it's not only for my constituency even though I have to focus on my responsibility but this this information can be used in any constituency across the island because there's a lot of flood areas in in our country um, so just be mindful of drains around your area and um, let's prevent any um, severity of flooding that being said, I'm going to move on now to, to we have a caller? We have a caller. I think, yeah, we can take that caller, then we'll take the yes. break, and then we can move on to another subject. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Yeah, pleasant good morning, one and all. Yeah, Thank I have a, a quick question for uh, Mr. Brian, if he could check this out for me. Yeah, some time ago last year, I was aware um, in the house that they were speaking about um, pensioners that were, wasn't making like $500 a month, that they would um, increase that to um, 500 starting in March. But... They, it hasn't been done as yet. I wonder if Mr. Brian, with his uh, capabilities, could check into that and find out why it hasn't taken place and when it will take place for me, please. Thank you very much for that call. All right. Well, um, if I'll try to quickly try to answer mm -hmm. that. Um, there seems to be some sort of mix-up in the speech that was delivered by the Premier uh, because I was of the same view as the caller, um, saying that persons who, who were obviously later in their working years before the pension came in who were getting basically nil um, um, pension or, or very little amounts, the way the speech was delivered as to say those persons would be considered to get some pension or get that uh, some amount, whether it's 500 or not. I, um, and I was of that view. So some of my constituents came to me and some constituents outside of my constituency also came to me and asked about it. So I inquired about that matter. 
Um, and according to the feedback I've gotten from some of the representatives in government, um, and I, I don't want to quote because I don't have the, the text with me now, I think I deleted it some time ago, is that no, that was for persons who were already getting pension at 500 to increase to 650. And I said, no, that's not what I understood from the speech. And they say to go back and look at the speech. And I read the speech again myself, and it seems to be some ambiguity on the interpretation of what was delivered. Now, during this break, I'm going to go back outside to get the premier's speech from the budget um, address and read that particular area because wording is very important because I interpreted exactly that same thing. But now the representatives of government is saying, no, that's not what they intended. And persons who are ex-civil servants who are not getting any pension or getting very little will not be getting that. And if anybody in government would like to clarify that, I'd be happy to hear because there are some persons who've come to me, not only this caller, about that exact same matter because I interpreted it exactly the same way. But according to them, that's not their intention. So I, I can only give you that. Um, I can formally ask for a clarification publicly from the government through the Legislative Assembly and see if they can clarify the matter. But besides that, I can't force them to answer. Sometimes I ask questions and they don't even bother to respond to me. So, uh, But I will try to uh, officially get the response from them again rather than indirectly behind closed doors because obviously a number of persons are still concerned about it. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mr. Brown. Folks, please stay tuned. Going to a commercial break and then for the record, we'll be back shortly. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record in the studio with me this morning, MLA, Mr. Kenneth Bryan and uh, former minister, former MLA, and I could say a lot of formers, uh, <laughs> permanent secretary, district commissioner, uh, Mr. <laughs> Gilbert McLean is with me also. I'm told that we have one caller, so we're going straight to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, O.C. Good, good morning, morning. ma'am. Good morning. How are you today? I am fine. And yourself? Yes, I'm fine. Thanks. Great. Yes. My question is to Mr. Brian. Okay. Yeah, and I'm glad that he's there this morning because I've been waiting to ask this question. I know he said yesterday that he was in the area of Crow Road and Palmdale and so forth around those areas there. But what I would like to ask him, I don't know if he can answer me, but my dad, Clifton Borden, lives off of Cool Road on Canal Lane. Yes, ma'am. And he's been there for 35 plus years. A sleeping policeman has been placed there about a year ago, or speed bump, whatever it is. And since that has been placed there, any time it rains, there's always this pool of water that settles in front of his yard. It, and it's not like it's in the earth itself, but because you know the road is asphalt, so it doesn't seep through right away. It stays there for a long time. So I would like to find out who gave anyone permission to put that speed bump right in front of his yard if they couldn't find some other place to put it. Right now, my dad is 95 years old, and he's bedridden. So I don't think we need to contend with any water that is there. So I would like to find out whoever put it there, if he could find out from the NRA who gave, and I would like if they could remove it and put it somewhere else. And, and Thank call, you. Call, call, call her, so the... Um, the water only started to accumulate after the speed bump was put there. Yes, uh -huh. that is correct. Okay. It never settled there no time. So I don't know who gave permission for that speed bump to put there. I know it wasn't one of his children, and it wasn't him. Okay, and uh, you you said you would want the speed bump removed, but what, what if, uh, are there any other uh, mitigating factors that they could uh, uh, or uh, remedies that they could use to let's say for instance if they were to put a drain there would that would that be uh, acceptable well that might help is right mm -hmm. but i don't think water used to settle there period uh -huh, uh -huh. so if they can put a drain there i would appreciate it but i think the speed bump needs to go okay Thank you very much for that caller. I think yeah, uh, caller's right. You yeah. know, it's a situation that was not that they created as a result of yeah. the speed bump. So they they should do something to alleviate the situation. I agree with you, OC, and I want to thank the caller for bringing that to my attention. I'll definitely take a drive down there today. It's always good to inspect as the rain is going on, so you can watch the flow of water. That's one of the key things I was doing yesterday. Is as the rain was happening, you watch the flow and the action of the water and see how it is happening. And and 
quite rightfully, she probably rightfully assumed that that the speed bump was the cause of that. I, I will definitely speak to somebody at the NRA to find out what is the best remedy, whether it means moving that speed bump further down the road or, or up earlier part of the road or just putting a drain there. Ultimately, um, the lady is right. Um, her father shouldn't be have to be exposed to, particularly at his age and if there's an emergency with um, flooding in the yard. So I'll definitely address the matter as soon as I possibly can. So thank you for the call. Yeah, and I would look at the speed bump being there as a plus for, uh, for, for, for way, her. Because yes. that means yeah. that the traffic has to slow down yeah. at, that, at that point there. So it could be a plus in that regard. So I, I would, my view would be that if they would put a drain yeah, there that yeah. would probably. Uh, yeah, you, you know, don't want suffice. speeding and noise, uh, particularly at his yeah. age, uh, uh, in his um, in his illness. Um, but I want so to it's say a, it turns out to be a win-win situation. Exactly. Him, then. Yeah. And and if Mr. Clifton I- is listening, I want to say hello to him. I know him well. CB. And, and um, yeah, Mr. CB, as everybody may know him, I hope he's he's doing okay. And, and to the family as well. Okay. All right. Um, I think we have about four minutes, three minutes, really, before we go to our eight <laughs> o'clock news. Uh, so you may want to put a teaser out there in terms yes. of. Yes. Uh, so ba- so know, basically, um, for the last two weeks now, we've been speaking. The whole country has been speaking about the element of what transpired in the UK Parliament, um, beneficial ownership and public registry. And what does that mean for the Cayman Islands and our economy and public revenue for the government? Um, some there's some fears out there that it's going to be a, a, a big deal. Some people think that it's not going to be that big of a deal. Uh, but the country has known about this fear, this threat for some time. And we have not prepared our country for the effects of this potential blow that obviously the signs are showing now that it's going to come. Um, and and I, I kind of, in, in my conversations with Mr. McLean, um, said, you know, I've had enough talking about what has happened or, or why it should have happened in our constitutional rights and this and that and everything. I, what I want to talk about is what are we going to do as a result? Because the fear is, is that we know that 50% of our GDP is associated directly or indirectly with financial services. So if there is a severe threat to lose 50% of our GDP, 50% of government revenue, where we know the budget this year was over close to $8 million, you're talking about close to $4 million in revenue lost to the government. We had a taste of what that's like, just to give the the audience a, 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 a feeling or a visual of what that's like that you remember in the global recession in 2008 2009 2010 how bad things were for Cayman it would probably be potentially even worse than that that's that's if we ever were to lose all of our financial services mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so if we are if, if we're going to lose that uh, or potentially can lose that as a result of this um, move or this decision of the UK and the House of Com- Commons what are we going to do about that before we come because we have at least the one positive thing about this, if there is any positive, is that we at least have a timeline to know when the blow is going to hit us. It gives us an opportunity to, pre- to prepare, unlike the, um, the, the crash in 2009, 2010, or unlike a hurricane that doesn't give you much time for preparation. So today, I want to talk about, when we come back from the break, about what are we, what can we do, what things can we do to prepare to soften the blow um, and, and, and what kind of blow is, will it be? Folks, we're going to our 8 o'clock news. When we return, the conversation will continue with MLA, Mr. Kenneth Bryan, and Mr. Gilbert McLean. So please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back immediately after the 8 o'clock news. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record in the studio. With me this morning, MLA, Mr. Kenneth Bryan, and former M- Minister and former MLA, Mr. Gilbert uh, McLean. I'm going to throw the mic back over uh, to Mr. Kenneth Bryan. And yes, I'm not physically throwing the mic back <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Corner. Uh, before we went to the break, we were speaking about um, what we do now as a country, considering the fact that all indications are that this one threat that we always feared is coming and it's suspected to come by 2020 that fear is that public registry of our company registrations here in the Kim Islands will potentially cause many of the registrations in our financial services to potentially leave 
we've yet to get anybody from any um, authority position to suggest the severity of this um, implication that is that the UK has um, allowed to happen or decided to make happen. But we can assume that it's going to be uh, a negative effect. Um, and because we don't know how severe that negative effect is, one will have to assume that it's or prepare for the worst. And we, most members of the public will also understand from, from advertising of the financial services in Cayman Finance in the last year and a half or so, or two years ago, that they were speaking about the importance of financial services to the Cayman Islands and the effects it has on our budget and our revenue. And um, most people may also understand that financial services are number one um, economy, our industry. Um, and, and figures were thrown out to some over 50% of our GDP is directly or indirectly associated with financial services. Um, over 50% of our revenue that the government makes is, um, is linked directly or indirectly to financial services. So because we don't know the severity of it and one would have to plan for the most um, serious of, a, of, of, a, of, of an option that, it, it, that this impacts us, we have to assume that we would lose 50% of our GDP and 50% of our revenue, which is a substantial amount with this year's budget being close to $8 million. So you're talking about a loss of $400 million. So if that was to happen, and there is a chance, whether it's small or large, we don't know yet, how do we prepare for that? And I think this is the time where, though government may be on a mission to try to um, stop this from being implemented, it seems like every indication from the past and recently within the House of Commons and, and the Parliament itself that this is going through. And until somebody from an authority position can say, okay, even if this happens, we're only going to be affected 5%, 10%. Um, only then can we prepare for that. So, so for me, if I was the leader of this country, I would start preparing for the worst case scenario. And I think this is the time for us. And I, we have always talked about creating new industries and, and diversifying our economy. I think of, as a matter of emergency, the government should have a contingency plan to prepare for the losses of revenue as a result of this potential blow um, or inevitable blow. But we just don't know how severe that blow will be. We just don't know how hard the punch is going to be. It might be a little bus slip or it could possibly knock you out. Um, uh, for just, just as an example there, <laughs> um, our analogy. So I say that government must, by, by way of emergency, start selling the message that the Cayman Islands is now, and I mean, we've always been open for business, at least that's what we'd be saying, but investors have to see it as a serious attempt by this government to be open to new ideas, new strategies, new industries, and be willing to work with overseas and local investors because it's not only overseas investors, we have a lot of rich, intelligent Caymanians here who've presented many times to government and to cabinet new strategies, new industries they'll be willing to go into. Um, and we've heard of many presentations to cabinet that they never really be considered. Um, or, or they've heard them and they just go, okay, we're not going to go down that route for whatever reason. We have to start selling this concept to the rest of the world and locally that we are open for business for new strategies because the potential loss of revenue to government and the potential loss of job opportunities for Caymanians is a priority. But now, don't, I, don't we also have to um, make it clear to the international community, and I think uh, we have done so so far, that it is our intentions because you you want to avoid the flight. You want to avoid that now because uh, there are businesses who may move to other jurisdictions mm -hmm. where these requirements are not in place. Yes. So for those businesses that are here in the Cayman Islands, now we want to assure them that we will fight and that we stand a very good chance of winning that fight in the courts in terms of the UK's uh, Parliament's ability to legislate for the Cayman Islands, the type of constitutional overreach that uh, we talk about and that mem many members of uh, the UK Parliament spoke about as well, the fact that they have never taken into consideration what you have said just now, the impact, the financial impact mm. Uh, on the overseas territories as well. We need to reassure those businesses that are here 
that we're going to fight this. And at the end of the day, we're going to be successful so that they remain here also. Oh, well, I agree. Of course, we don't want to create panic. But um, as a representative of the people, you're expected to have plan B, plan C, plan D, so you can ultimately, if the worst case scenario happened, whether that is a half of a percent chance, prepare for that. One thing that we've failed to do, and we do it too often, is we know there's a threat, and financial services downturn in 2009 is exactly one of them. This current leader himself was involved in an administration where they were given evidence or given advice that, listen, this is happening. Do not spend too much money because there's going to be a downturn and recession in the country. And they didn't take it. I don't want that to happen again. I don't want Cayman to go through that type of scenario again. So we need to start preparing for the worst case scenario, regardless of how severe that is. And of course, I'm not saying that the government doesn't go ahead with what they're doing now. Um, what we have to have is two simultaneous plans going at the same time. Now, I want to give Mr. McLean an opportunity mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. speak because I don't want him just here yeah. not saying anything. But talking about diversifying our economy and start to sell this message of open door to create new industries in the event just if that small chance happens that we lose that industry or lose a small percentage or a large percentage of it because I don't think that we're going to lose all of it but if they get to be successful in what their attempts are I think that we will lose some of it we don't know how much and no specialist is willing to say how much this I think there needs to be a survey but that being said we're not talking we're not going to talk about that but but talking about what can we do to moving forward and, and mr mclean has has uh, previously stated that we're supposed to diversify our economy and he's haven't even had ideas so at this particular stage i'd like to um bring him into the conversation yeah i think he he made a visit to the uk at one point in time he and mr uh, Bryce. roy borden and uh we're, t- we're told that as well mr mclean uh thank you see thank you uh, uh mr brian yeah i i i think this this is something that has been that has occurred, which was unexpected. Uh, as, as best as I can read and understand it, that, that is the case. But it is something which has really struck at the heart, or half of the heart of what we've had beating now for a, a few years, because as, as you know, it has always been said that we have two pillars, uh, tourism and the financial services. Of course, uh, Call it what we may, we say financial services. They're those who uh, say uh, a tax haven, and they, they play with words. It depends who's saying mm-hmm. what in this particular regard. But what has occurred, I, I think you're right, and, and uh, what uh, Mr. Brian has said as well, that they hardly looked at what the impact would be. In fact, the only instance that I heard some reference made as to the effect it might have was BVI. And as you were saying before we came back on air, Mm -hmm. it is because they are in the very slow process of recovering from the hurricane. So at least they took a, a notice of that. Again, I wonder what it's supposed to serve. Why uh, open up uh, the register publicly that every Tom, Dick, and Harry, as the as the saying goes, can go to see what this one or that one has and who's the names and so forth and so on. What purpose does that serve? Is that really openness and transparency, the, the, the buzzwords nowadays? Or is it something which is going to simply scare people who have uh, investments here or is doing business here, that they will pull out of here, go elsewhere. And of course, uh, I believe that ultimately they will want to those businesses to move to London, where again, I've, I've never been into the financial services business, but they tell me that the, that is the heart center of financial services worldwide, mm-hmm, really. Mm-hmm. I've heard some say New York, but others say, it is uh, London. It is London. Mm-hmm. Now, the, it also comes down to the question of what is happening now in terms of government's action, where we understand that uh, two QCs are, have been engaged to work on this, and it does appear that there may be some 
uh, reasonable opportunity to make a case through the courts that what has happened should not happen, taking into consideration all the various factors that have not been debated and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I found it, if I may interrupt you for a second, I want to ask if you found it a little ironic that it was either through listening uh, to the debate in the House of Lords or reading the transcripts from the Hansard in the House of Lords that we here in the Cayman Islands actually got the names of the two QCs who had been engaged by the Cayman Islands, uh, um, <laughs> Sir Jeffrey Joel and uh, Lord Panic. Mm -hmm. um, that had, uh, to my knowledge, I don't, knew about I, I don't believe that it was publicly yeah. stated in the Cayman Islands. I'm not sure if it was an oversight or what because it shouldn't have been any big secret at yes. the end of the day. You weren't tilting your hands or right. anything like that in, in that regard. A little ironic that we had to learn it from the Hansards or our listening uh, live. Yes. And the other thing with that, O.C., is that these are two people who are, are in the House of Lords, are they not? Uh, well, uh, uh, Panic is. Pa yeah. Yes, no, yes. Panic, no, panic yeah. is. And we have one, uh, Jeffrey Cox, in the... Um, House of Commons, yeah. um, I think he has uh, represented clients here in the Cayman yes. Islands as well as a QC. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it all comes down to, to being quite strange. I mean, here, here they are a part of it. It was uh, one of them who was there that gave the assent, the consent, which is their way of voting, it seems, in the, in the House of Commons. And, of course, then there is the question I, of the supremacy of of Parliament. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've heard that argued by various persons, including lawyers here and other persons. And if if you'd allow me a, a minute just to, Certainly, I think to read something important. here. Yes. It, it is from a book called How Parliament Works by Paul Silk, who is an authority. He's been knighted. He's been a, a clerk of the Parliament and so forth, so on. Anyone can, can uh, uh, Google it. It says, uh, and it is captioned, the constitutional theory of parliamentary so sovereignty. The sovereignty of parliament is a principle of the British Constitution. As we will see, this does not imply any theory about where political power actually rests in Britain, but parliament is described as sovereign because it is settled part of the way the British state operates that any act of parliament can make or unmake any law, whatever. Mm -hmm. No one can question the legality of an act of parliament. An act could be passed to make all Welshmen wear kilts or all cars drive backwards or for, a, for only orange jellies to be sold in the supermarkets. More fundamental and serious laws could be passed to ban all political parties except one, for example, and no court or other authority could say quote, this law is unjust or foolish or unconstitutional, end quote, and order its overturn. It also uh, states in final print here, the legislative authority of Parliament extends over the United Kingdom and all its colonies and foreign possessions. And there are no other limits to its power of making laws for the whole empire than those which are incidental are incident to all sovereign authority. The willingness of the people to obey or their authority to resist. Unlike the legislatures of many other countries, it is bound by no fundamental charter or constitution, mm -hmm. but has itself the sole constitutional right of establishing and altering the laws and governments of the country. This theoretical sovereignty is, of course, subject to practical limitations. Yes. R. A. Butler, in a famous phrase echoing Bismarck, called politics, quote, the art of the possible, end quote. Laws cannot be enforced which do not recognize realities. And the most important of these realities was what Erskine may call, quote, the willingness of the people to obey or their power to resist, end quote. Now, that kind of seems to put into uh, words what different persons here have been saying since this thing all came about. Mm -hmm. What are the practicalities and so on? Is, is it real? 
should it uh, should we accept it or should we resist it? Okay, you know, time for a commercial a break. break. Yeah. Uh, we have to take a break, but when we return, we will continue along that same thread that Mr. McLean was on. Please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back shortly. And welcome back to For the Record in the studio with me this morning, uh, MLA Mr. Kenneth Bryan, and also former minister, former member of the Legislative Assembly, uh, Mr. Um, Gilbert uh, McLean um, as well. And uh, before we went to the break, you heard Mr. McLean um, question, uh, sorry, read, read from uh, gentleman author uh, Silk, um, How Parliament Works. And... Um, I would just, in, in part of that, talking about Parliament being supreme and everything else and the right to legislate for not only the UK but for its colonies as well, and that is recognized, and it's the question of how and how far do you go, how do you, how do, you do it? Uh, UK does Dealing not have a realities. UK does not have a written constitution, so everything has to do uh, with customs and conventions um, as well, and what needs to be recognized with that also is that the UK has entered into, as a matter of fact, they were the ones that pushed for it, for advanced, more advanced constitutions for the overseas uh, territories. We saw uh, Gibraltar, I think it was in 2006, 2007, Turks and Caicos, 2009, Cayman Islands, I forget um, uh, when uh, BVI um, Anguilla, some of the others as well, but they pushed for that. Yeah. So the constitution that we have, it's, a do it's not just a piece of paper. Uh, there are certain obligations that we have, certain obligations that the UK has also, and that they are bound to abide by. Um, none of us are lawyers here, but at the end of the day, this is something that the lawyers will you know, uh, argue, argue in, in, yes. in, in, in a court of law. But I believe that based on what we see in the debates in the House of Lords and in the House of Commons, that there are also members of the UK Parliament who question, to a certain extent, the ability of the UK to legislate in these particular instances, especially in those instances where the constitutions are specific in terms of what the reserve powers of the, the governor uh, what those powers are and those responsibilities that have been delegated to ministers as well. Okay, um, and, and and thank you, OC, for 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 clarifying the d debate about whether this can be done or not. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that debate will continue for quite some time. What I'm hoping for today is not about the debate of whether the UK can do this or they can't do this, but the fact that there is a potential chance whether it may be small or large, that they will do this. That's what we're focusing on, which is what I would say is the contingency plan. What is the plan B if they are successful? And while I support the government and everybody who is involved in this continued battle to try to prevent this from happening, I think it's very much in, and just as important as the battle to stop it is the battle to prepare for it if, in fact, it happens. So... I, I, this is what I would like to focus the conversation on today in respect to if we were to f so foresee in the future and we said, you know something, it has happened. And the financial services as a result is not happy about it. And we start to deplete in those industry. What do we do as a result? We need to maintain those revenues. So what do we do? And, and we've been saying it for quite some time now about diversification of our economy. We've actually even had threats from the UK to say, start looking into different industries because financial services is something that we don't want you in. And I've, I've probably heard that this week, the last two weeks now, about seven times from different people who said they were, remember the threats directly. Mm. I, I think it's time to take those threats seriously. I think that everybody here would, would, would say it's better to be, um, what, what, how's the saying go again? Um, better to be safe than sorry. Um, 
So this is what I'm trying to accomplish today. Now, if in fact we are wrong and we succeed in our battle to, to prevent this and the, and the UK is wrong and they overreach their constitutional um, um, powers in respect to the Cayman Islands, then business as usual continues. And then um, even in fact, if we did go down the road of opening our, bus- our, our doors and our economy to new industries, it's icing on the cake. So if we get more money coming in from different industries uh, and our financial services maintains its, its current flow and current um, status, then there's nothing wrong with that. But if that one small chance happens where we lose our financial services to whatever degree, we have to prepare for that loss. We cannot we cannot handle another recession like um, atmosphere and environment in the country. So that's what we're talking about. And and and. To give an example of some of those types of, of areas, Mr. McLean had one time suggested ideas. Now, whether we agree with the ideas or not, I think that it's time for us to start considering new ideas. If I was the minister, if I was the premier, I would be calling investors at this moment to say, listen, we're willing to listen to some of those new ideas. If you have business proposals, if you have conceptual new industries that you'd like to bring to the Cayman Islands, come and present to cabinet because we may consider them. Because if... But again, this, is, this is as a result of this action that the UK has taken or, or shouldn't this be something or isn't this something that the government would do on a, a, you know as a matter of uh, of course I, I i think that you're right in suggesting that it should be doing it anyway because we keep on continuing to hear about diversification diversification but yet still we're not seeing any um it took the last two administrations ago under the honorable now speaker mr bush to actually have a new industry introduced here which was um health city uh, we haven't seen any new industries under this current leader, but we hear him talk about it. When are we going to take this a serious approach to saying, listen, we need to have new industries in the country? And I, I, I'm not sure if we're selling the attitude to investors locally and abroad that we are open to try new things. We've heard so many times of new ideas, whether it be um, um, the, the, the conk farm up in the East End, whether it be a transshipment, or, and I'm not suggesting any of these ideas or things that I particularly want, but we need to start giving options to the country in the event that this blow that is pending, and that's the interpretation of many, if this blow that is pending is going to hit us. So if you were to tell the Caymanian today that, listen, um, we're going to lose $300 million in revenue as a result of this, and it's going to happen. We look down the road and that actually happens. People may will may be more open to certain ideas if they knew that this was going to happen. And I think just like how you would tell your child, listen, save your money, um, prepare, and, and make sure you don't find yourself in, 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 in a difficult position. That's what we need to do now as leaders of this country. And I think Mr. McLean has been saying this for quite some time of ways to, to find new revenue. And, and one of his ideas, I, I think, is something that potentially we as a country need to decide or, or look into even further of whether we want it or not. And I want also not only... To, to discuss one of the things he just he is um, supported before, but also to let the world and local investors know that the country is ready and willing to listen to new strategies, new ideas, new potential industries, because we see the importance of being prepared just in case. So, Mr. McLean, um, you probably want to rehash one of those ideas that you've said for, for some time. Yes, indeed. And thank you again. Uh, On two different occasions, I have placed in the manifesto in which I ran in the elections at the time, the idea that we should create a national lottery. And for certain reasons, because I tried to keep it in the realm of uh, common sense and that which is practical, as I have just read from that uh, book and what what uh, persons may accept. In 1990, in the Finance Committee, it's in Hansard, Commissioner Thursfield, when asked about what did, how much did he consider the illegal lottery in the Cayman Islands represented, he said that while they had no 
clear and accurate figures. They estimated that it represented about a a million dollars per week. Now, if we take that as a figure to work with, there are 52 weeks in a year, so that's 52 million per year. If we take it from 1990 to last year, 2017, that's 27 years. And easy arithmetic, if we take uh, the 52 million by 27, in that period of time, 1 billion 404 million dollars was actually transacted, if you want to use that term for it. In more recent times, I have been reliably informed that it has, of course, the population has grown, and it seems like uh, more and more people are in the lottery game. Yeah, because you have the Honduran, you got the Belizean, you got the Jamaican one, I believe there's another one. BVI? from the Eastern Caribbean. BVI, I mean, I, I, I was amazed to learn that in, in recent times. And I believe you can probably pay numbers now from 7 o'clock in the morning until probably 7 o'clock at night or later. They run straight through almost 24 yeah, hours and, now. And I, I was saying to someone just yesterday, uh, the I, I understood the Jamaica lottery was playing five times. He said, no, no, you're wrong. He says they play six. <laughs> yes. So, you know, the, these are realities that's happening in this society. And and uh, when, if we take, I understand now it's between two to five million per week. Let's take a median of three million. Three million per week, 52 weeks, is 156 million per year. Let's take a decade. If we take a decade from this year going forward, the money that will have transacted in that time is one billion five hundred and sixty million dollars. Now, gentlemen, we're not talking about checks that may bounce up. <laughs> we're talking about cash yeah. in this society. Cash which is going out of this country. Cash which, if the government was to legalize the national lottery like it is in Florida, that could go to education, uh, health care, and social services. That has been my argument throughout the years, and certainly now. We always hear, well, the churches, we got to pause. Okay, well, uh, no, I'll, no, I'll finish, your, finish your thought. Yeah, the, the, the churches isn't going to like it, and the church is going to this and that and the other. The church is, is not the argument nor the premise that this decision has to be made on. And I see you've got to go to the break. Yep. I have some more to say if you come. Certainly. Back. And uh, folks, please stay tuned. For the record, we'll be back immediately after this short break. For the record with Orit Connor continues right now on Radio Cayman. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record in the studio with me this morning, MLA, Mr. Kenneth Bryan, former MLA, former minister, Mr. Gilbert McLean. And uh, we had to interrupt uh, Mr. McLean to go to a commercial break, so we're going straight back to Mr. McLean. Yes, thank you, Osi. As I was saying, based on taking $3 million per week, which would be uh, $156 million uh, dollars per annum over uh, the, the year, three million times 52, and that what the money that would accrue, say, from 2018, 10 years from now, is $1,560,000. Now, I know the argument uh, about the churches, and there are persons who I know who are very uh, much into churches and that it's not a good thing and so, so forth and so on. I give them all of their their beliefs, and they have a right to them. But I think the question comes down to, can this government, the one in the past or the one that will come, allow over a, bil- a billion and a half dollars over the next 10 years to go into the hands of a dozen or let's say two dozen people who sell numbers in this country with no benefit to the people Mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And if that was harnessed by the government via national lottery, 
what what a major significance it would be. At least it would be a hundred and 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 fifty-six million every year or more. And the fact if it became legal, then more people would buy it and could buy it. They would not be committing any illegal mm -hmm. act. Mm -hmm. And you know what what I wonder about. I know that in 1980, the the late uh, James Manoa Barton had went to Dade County and came and became a twin city with, with Dade County. Mm -hmm. I wonder if anyone nowadays know that or if anything is done to work on that because when or it happened... take advantage of, uh, of what... Yes, yeah. yes, because I know when it started back then it was a question of the fact that Dade County could assist us with, with fire equipment and also with, with police cars and, and anything that could benefit we 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 could uh, deal with them, and they would assist us and so on because those were the undertakings. Now I I don't know if the present uh, persons in authority even know that that happened, and if it happened, do they work on it now? Do they use it for tourism or whatever the case may be? But certainly they they have a, a system which has been established, and they. I believe would not hesitate to assist us with the necessary electronic uh, systems and so on, which could let that work here in Cayman. It wouldn't even put the, the, the number of bankers out of business because each one could be licensed to sell it and everyone could buy. It wouldn't be limited to the persons here locally. It could be sold to people like ourselves. If we go to Florida, we can buy the Florida lottery and it's something that would be honored across the board. So I believe, uh, O.C., and, and to the question that uh, MLA, Mr. Bryan, has raised, that one of the alternatives to finding some another area of revenue, a significant area of revenue, would be to bring about a national lottery to, so that the government could have access to that $156 million dollars every year. And the other point that I, I would make is that no one is saying to either one of the ministers in government now or MLAs, look, you got to decide whether there's going to be a national lottery or not. But what I think that is incumbent on them and is required of them in the face of what is happening now and I, 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 I would say that I, I know and I've read that the police are disrupting a, quite a lot of this business of uh, national lottery. But certainly, they would not have that same amount of work if it was legal. There would still be those who would try to do it illegally. But, you know, it would be there. Everybody would have access to it. But flipping back uh, right away to what I believe is the responsibility of the of the people elected by the people is to give the people the opportunity of deciding whether they would wish to have one or not mm -hmm. via a referendum. And it would just be a matter of a yes or no. Do you support uh, Cayman having a national lottery? Yes or no. Those who want to vote against it will vote against it. Those who agreed with it would vote for it. And if it came 50% and more, then they, it would be a clear indication to the government, including the government of the day, that, look, let's move forward and let's collect $156 million per annum. M Mr. McLean, if I, can, if I can add another element to it, right? I mean, obviously, we are a Christian society, so there's going to be persons who oppose that concept. Quite and, so. for, and, and, and for me, it's neither here nor there. My job is to represent 50 plus one of my constituency because that's how democracy works. So my job is to act on their behalf. So if there was a referendum and the people of Georgetown Central felt that was their their um, their will, then my job is to represent their will. So um, at the end of the day, if there, I, I think with the current circumstances, we have to look at all options. And, and make the people choose for themselves. So I think you're right on that respect. And if it's, we, you'd be surprised people's opinions on things um, may change if the circumstances of their lives change. 
Um, but ultimately, as legislators, I think it's our job to do what the people would like us to do. And we only know that by way of referendum. So I support that concept, regardless of what I believe um, gaming is in respect to our Christian heritage. It's not about the representatives views, but about what the people's views are. But but that is only one topic um, um, for the listening audience to consider, which is a lottery. Um, or, or, not, or, or gaming or what have you in respect to raising revenue. If this um, current situation that we're having with the UK with public registry is, poten- uh, is as severe as it could be, meaning the loss of our financial services and the loss of 50% of our GDP, loss of 50% of our revenue, we still have loads of more money to make up. Because if, in fact, the people were to choose um, gaming or, or national lottery and there was the amount of $150 million worth of revenue, we wouldn't take all of that. It would be government would have a portion of it and not, um, other countries suggest about 40%. So let's just say we got 40% of the $150 million. We're talking about, um, about 60, 50 to $60 million worth of revenue. But... If we were to lose our financial services in its totality, we're talking about losing revenue of 350 to $400 million. So we still would need other industries to look at to, to, to make up that shortfall, right? And some of the other things that we need to start considering is government stepping back on some of the spending. I think also with the approach of opening up our doors to new industries and, uh, and new concept ideas, the government also has to come out publicly and say, listen, what is going to be our financial decisions moving forward on our spending habits as a result of the unknown effects of what's going to happen by 2020? Like, for instance, a lot of people are speaking about the port and the severe commitment of that port. If, in fact, it happens, the government has given an indications for the last administration and this administration, their commitment to the port and the severity of that commitment, considering the fact we are not sure about our revenue stream in the future because of this unfortunate danger that is coming. So the government has to tell the people what their spending strategies are going to be over the next the rest of this term because those spending habits i believe has to be changed and amended a little bit whether a lot or a little but we have to be more reserved now with the unfortunate circumstances that are happening and if they don't say that it's unfair to the people in that respect but there's a number of other industries that we've heard over the last decade or the last five years that, that can be considered. Some of just, just off the top of my head, I was just checking my memory of, of, of ideas that I've heard that seem to never ever um, were, were, were taken seriously uh, or never kicked off in, in, in the Cayman Islands. One, diamond, uh, diamond mining and other precious stones where they can be brought from other countries and mined here as an industry because of, uh, um, of trade agreements between um, countries like Africa and the like and the United States. There was opportunities here. I remember that. Re- mined I, or, or, re- mined. Or, refined. or refined? Cut. Uh, Cut, sorry, not cut, mining, yeah. um, refined. Yeah. My apologies. Thank you so much for that because I would we're hit to get the wrong idea. Um, you wouldn't mind having that <laughs> in mind, <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> um, also, um, um, obviously, you heard about um, the, the lottery. Medical research was also another one that was presented. Also, somebody just sent me a text about cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain technologies is, is a big thing now that's 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 taking the market is something that we can go into is there legislation that we can create to to give um those types of companies the opportunity to come here and set up here in the cayman islands um also um <coughs> agriculture uh, in respect to to fisheries and and, and Talk a little bit. I want you to talk a little bit about that because that option was yeah. at one stage uh, a consideration um, here. But I know that we had to go to a break. Yep. And when we come back, we'll talk more. Folks, about please it. stay tuned. We're going to headline news for the records. We'll return, return immediately after. That matter for the record with Orrit Connor continues right now on Radio Cayman. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. Just a little bit of housekeeping before uh, I go back to our guests, uh, Mr. Kenneth Bryan and Mr. Gilbert McLean. I have received several WhatsApp messages in relation to um, various subjects. I haven't um, read them out yet because some of them are not 
connected with uh, what we're discussing this morning, and I know uh, Mr. Bryan wants to concentrate on this particular um, topic. So um, if we don't deal with them today, um, because they're general questions, I will deal with them on Friday's show as well. I also received um, an email from the chief officer in the min um, in the uh, portfolio of the civil service, and um, she understands that we, there was a question about uh, plans to increase payments for public service pensioners, um, and uh, she has an update on that. I'm trying to reach her, uh, or I've sent a message to her seeing whether or not she wants to call into the show. If we're unable to get that information this morning, I will share that with our listening and viewing audience on Friday once I'm able to obtain that as well, but that certainly um, formed part of uh, the conversation that Mr. Bryan uh, was having uh, this morning as well. So we're not ignoring your WhatsApp messages, um, but because they're unrelated to what we're discussing, I promise you that they will be addressed at, at, on a future show on Friday um, as well. Do we have any calls, Ms. Uh, Susan? Uh, we have one caller. Let's go to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Uh, good morning to you, Mr. Wosi. Good morning, good sir. Good morning to Emily and a friend. Good morning, Mr. Gibber. A clean of wealth. Good, good morning. morning. You got here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Gentlemen, it seems as if in May, a lot of important things happened in the history of our planet. Uh, with our little island, of course, not because May is my birth month, but uh, <laughs> in all the islands we know in May when um, Lord Sligo, the British governor of Jamaica, brought that document here that um, ended the institution, ended the apprenticeship system of slavery here. It was always, it was slavery had already been abolished some 10 months before that. Of course, a lot both school students or teachers didn't know that either, but anyhow, I guess it's not important anymore. Another important thing that happened in May, and it affected the whole of the history of the whole um, world, is that that was the month when um, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill signed the Atlantic Chart on board the brand new British battleship, the Prince of Wales, and um, that essentially made um, America enter the war. Uh, the, that made them the friends forever and allies forever, and also en um, entered the war, so to speak. Um, at first, slowly, we know it, but, it, but anyhow. And if America hadn't entered the war, anyone who knows the history of the Second World War, which changed the world forever, uh, the, the Axis powers would have won. It's simple. Um, and um, in May, of course, also just after that, the British, um, the famous German battleship Bismarck was spotted by an American observer and sank. He couldn't fly as a pilot and uh, was subsequently sank. And again, that could have changed the course of the war. Again, people who knew anything about the naval history know that what I'm saying is fact. It said escape. Uh, what we're saying, and, and I, I find it sort of difficult to accept, and I'm glad we're talking about, you know, trying the new industries and the and so forth, but we have one big investor who has come here and invested a lot of money, and a lot is going on and employing a lot of people and their equipment and so forth. The dark, the Mr. Kenneth Dark. So we have one here, but we hear him being cursed every day. Sometimes, as several people, some praise him. And um, so maybe the same thing would happen if investors came, but it's open knowledge. His is, I uh, guess, public registry, but I guess he has financial businesses, service to industries, which are not public knowledge, I guess. I hope so. I don't know. Um, and we, we, what you said about the gambling, Mr. Um, uh, McLean, you're, you're spot on, but I think it's a lot more money than that. Anyhow, um, oh, no. <laughs> it, it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more. Um, but anyway, people have been saying this for years, I've been suggesting that the government could make some taxes out of it, and they can do it simple ways. 
um, very simple ways, but the same numbers saying taxing it. Um, the, 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 what, what I fail to grasp is this. Mr. Dart knew that the chances he's taking, any businessman knows the chances he's taking, and with the powerful brain that we have in the financial world, we're now saying that they were ill-prepared for this, that they didn't warn their investors that this, there is this possibility that this might happen, and uh, with all their knowledge of, of day-to-day transactions and with the British and what is happening and, and their regulatory staff and their... That they didn't warn their investors already that this might happen, so we have to have contingency plans in case of that. And suddenly now we find that we are going to hire... Uh, with a stock, about six, seven hundred lawyers here, we have to hire two QCs. Uh, I, I hope that the, um, the financial world will stand in here. We'll put that bill, of course, because it is to their advantage. I mean, or, or the major portion of it, because let's face facts: the people who are employed in it, when the upper echelons of it, earn big, big money. You all know more about that than I do, and um, that they this. Suddenly, you have to have something happen to shake up and say, well, bam, we have to um, have contingency plans now. We have to do something now. We have to tell the people now. And that they throw out all their money. Suddenly, if this comes into play, um, personally, I'm going to tell you, and I'm an uneducated person. They all know I have no university education or anything. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an economist, not an accountant. I don't think that this will be the end of the world for Cayman. I don't think so, the financial services of it. I do not think so. But if others want to think so, so be it. Yes, we should have a long time ago, Mr. Jim Borden suggested that, diversifying our, our um, industries and going to small industries. used to talk about assembling things here like the Irish do with the assembly electronic parts for all over the world, um, particularly the Japanese and Korean cars and all that, because women are very dexterous, and all women here with their hands and handcraft and could easily learn to assemble those electronic things. You don't have to have any um, university or college degree to do those things. It can be done, but assembling things. And, and, um, but also... Um, we, 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 we should have concentrated a long time. He used to say, Mr. Jim, I'll never forget it, I'm afraid this can, um, this is just a Disney World. People say, you know, it, it's um, risky, but it's a Disney World, he used to say with the financial thing. Carl, I'm going to ask you to wrap, wrap up for us, please. I, I, I thank you for listening. Me. I'm just trying to throw the idea across that we suddenly say that we should do these things now because of some catastrophe or we these people hadn't prepared their investors for this yeah. I, I find that hard to accept that they hadn't made some kind of plans from a long time with all the brain power that's in it I, I i personally find it very hard to accept i commend the premier and all who are trying to do something as far as the government is concerned mm-hmm. thank you very much caller for that we have one more caller caller good morning welcome to for the record yes good morning uh good morning I have two questions. My first question is this. Um, what was the aim or what is the aim of um, England wanting us to do this? Mm-hmm. Like, is, is, are there any beneficial benefits from this? And now that they have passed, they want this to happen. Is there anything that came and can do about it? Two very good questions, caller. Uh, the, 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 the first uh, one, the answer to that is that um, the European Union, well, first of all, the UK has a public register now that they want us to basically (coughs) duplicate. There have been complaints that that register has lots of flaws to it and stuff Mm. like that, right? Um, The European Union, those countries are set, it's 2023 to bring in public registers. There are questions in relation to whether or not that 
will happen because there are questions relating to human rights issues and privacy issues as well. What the UK wants us to do is want, they want us to be ahead of everyone else in terms of, and when I say us, all of the, the overseas territories, to introduce publicly accessible registers ahead of everyone else, which means that it will put the overseas territories at a disadvantage. So that is why the, um, the legislation is being done. Everyone thinks that it's unfair, um, and uh, we have indicated our um, intention to challenge that as well. The other question in terms of um, what we can do about it, the based on what I have seen and listened to in the debates, the um, legislation, unlike the Cayman Islands in our parliament where if you make an amendment to a bill before it comes becomes law, that amendment is included in the bill. In the UK, this is not the case. And I will read what Lord McKay of uh, Clash Fern, a conservative <laughs> member, says. Um, he says, um, here, my lords, I want uh, to raise with the minister the question of how the amendment we are discussing can come into force. It is not covered by the existing list of sections that come into force uh, when the bill receives royal assent. Therefore, it requires to be brought in by regulation. If it is correct, and I must say I assume that the authorities who have spoken on it already are certainly correct, that it is contrary to the legal rights of the territories, it may be that the regulation seeking to bring this provision into force would be challenge challengeable by judicial review. In any case, we know from experience that the mere fact that something has been put into statute does not mean it will happen if it is subject to being brought into law by a ministerial action. It may never be brought into law at all. I have fairly profound experience on that uh, myself. Um, so it has to be brought in by regulation. Regulations have to be um, brought into effect by a minister. It could sit there forever. Of course, they also have to recognize uh, the will of parliament as well. I think, um, I think I, I, I would like the opportunity to kind of respond to some of the okay. comments and suggestions. Susan wants to take a break. We're going to take a break. Um, is that, um, do we have someone from the portfolio of the civil service on, on, on the line there? Ms. Susan, you're not sure who it is? Okay, let's take a commercial break. For the record, we'll be back shortly. And welcome back to For the Record. We have three callers. Let's go to the phone lines. First caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, O.C., Gilbert, and Kenny. Good morning. Um, I have a quick question. Exact, does anyone know exactly the wording? Um, is it law that they passed or um, know that they're saying that we have to do this in 2020? Does anyone know the exact law of these um, in relation to the public um Bill um, register. You mean the, the the motion itself? What is it exactly saying? Yeah, because my thing is right. I'm a person. I've been um, doing corporate um, for the better part of my career, and that is my career. And of course, I'm concerned about it. But being a person who's also been around lawyers for quite a while, there's always a way a to do this work, right? And one of the things is what I keep hearing is this public register, this public register, this public register. Well, for these companies, in your articles or bylaws, which governs your company, why can't they then, and I'm saying this, um, looking at it from outside the box, right? Have a public register and have a private register. This is what the public gets, and then this is what the is for us for private. You know what? You can put on that public register anything, right? This is who owns what is for the public to see. It is not private. That is why I'm asking, mm -hmm. how is the wording? Because if this is something for the public, you can put in your articles. 
that we will maintain a public register and a private register. Mm-hmm. Very good point. Good point. Very good good point. point. And I've seen that uh, uh, articulated and heard it articulated elsewhere as well. We want to thank I, the caller for that. I think it's important before we go to the next caller, though, is for, for persons like herself who are in the industry to somehow publicize the, the actual motion itself so people can read it and then start to make their own determination. I would suggest that you go to the... Uh, Parliament UK website and look up the motion is anti-corruption um, legislation. It's called it sanctions and, and uh, santi- sanctions and anti-money laundering bill. And it's section six, I think. Uh, no, no amendment. Um, amendment 20. six. Yeah. So, so you can you can look online there and maybe find the wording there. Go ahead. Yeah. In in actually in the House of Commons now I think it's the amendment. 20 something or something like that as as well okay uh we have two callers for caller good morning welcome to for the record good morning mr oc good morning ma'am and this is georgia and good morning and my leg kenny bryan and also good morning to mr gilbert mclean who was one good morning miss georgia good morning i trust that all three of you can Truthfully, say that your family members are all well. And yes, I have thank one you. single sentence to say. I respect you three gentlemen, but I have a feeling there's something you three gentlemen have forgotten. Our mother country, our mother country, England, is envious <laughs> and jealous of what we have accomplished. That's all I have to say. And thank you, Mr. O.C., and God bless. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Georgia, for that. Not only are they jealous of us, ready to put uh, trust under the bus. They have done that on more than one occasion <laughs> as well. <laughs> okay, I think we have uh, Ms. Gloria from the uh, Portfolio of the Civil Service. Good morning, ma'am. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, Mr. Connor. How are you today? I'm fine. And yourself? Very good. Thank you so much. And good morning as well to MLA, Mr. Bryan, and as well to Mr. Gilbert McLean and the listening public. Good morning, Ms. Gloria. Sir, I understood there was a question that may have been raised earlier about whether or not um, the government was proceeding with the um, proposal to increase pension payments (coughs) for public service pensioners who were receiving a pension that was um, below uh, 650 per month. Did that question come up? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. I, I just wanted to give some assurances there. The Public Service Pensions Board is a part of our portfolio of subjects, and I can tell you that this is a matter they've been actively working on and are in the process now of launching that. Um, the payments will commence uh, starting next month, so for the June payroll for pensioners. Um, any pensioner who's Caymanian has worked in the public service um, as a part of the public service um, pensions plan for at least 10 years and who is making below that 650 a month would receive um, an uplift that would take them to 650 a month for 2018 and next year would see that uplift take them to a total of 750 um, per month. So the uplift would make sure that their minimum pension um, is at least 650 um, per month this year and at least 750 next year. And for the persons who are already in our pension plan who um, are below that threshold, the um, uplift would be retroactive to January of this year. Okay. okay. That's good news. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Gloria. We certainly appreciate that. And again, the traits of a good and dedicated civil servant as well. Ms. Gloria, thank you very much. God bless. Thank you as well, gentlemen. God bless. Um, Um, Very quickly, um, one of our listeners says, uh, good day, guys. Personally think uh, it is the smartest thing that could happen uh, for the Cayman Islands, talking about the lottery that you all talked about. And I said I would also like to add that it would be great for college education, road works, and it would also um, create um, jobs as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but before I go, because I, w- I want to be able to have a, kind of like last word, I'll give yeah, you Yeah, I think we're going to we, we, we're gonna cut off the phone calls at this point in time, Ms. Susan, uh, for, for a wrap-up. Okay. Um, Mr. McLean? You want to have a few words for it close? Yeah, uh, just to say, uh, Mr. Ryan, I'm I'm glad that you have actually provoked discussion as you have today. Um, 
I am very happy to have had the opportunity of being here with you and to offer what I think is an area where the government could immediately get cash. And uh, the, it, that money then could be uh, deployed to offer assistance in the areas which are significant to the whole society. And uh, just that one point where you, you mentioned when you and I spoke yesterday that I was uh, telling you about a, a place called Harbor Branch and and the things that can be mm. done there and that I met the lady there who was actually had, who actually had the oversight of the conch uh, farm in Turks and Caicos. And there are various areas. And, of course, I've always been an advocate for agriculture. So if we, if we don't have to import, then we 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 save that we save that money yep so you know there, there's so much more could be said with this but of course time is against us then uh, once again just thank you and and uh mr connor and the listening audience for staying in there with us uh, thanks for being here to uh, mr mclean mr brian um mr mclean thank you so much for coming with me it's important a man of your stature to be here and and, and um be a part of my guest i almost feel like i'm part of being your guest rather than you being a part uh, of my guest but i want to say thank you so much i think that um, we share the viewpoint in respect to diversifying their economy regardless uh if it's just that one part of it in respect to, to to local lottery um that's just an example of what is available out there. And speaking of which, is one that I wrote down that I remembered that wasn't, um, I didn't, I didn't mention, uh, which was a proposal in the past of uh, of a serious mega yacht services and headquarters here in the Cayman Islands. And there's millions and millions of dollars that are that are out there in respect to that field in that industry that can be um, accessible to Cayman and to our government. And it's something that we can also consider. So there's a number of different industries that sh we should look into. But in my closing up, I want to say this because I don't want persons to think that I'm trying to put the country in fear of what um, is potentially going to happen or what could happen. But my job is as a representative is to prepare for all likely scenarios. We've had situations before where we weren't prepared. And I'd rather say that we take the, the responsibility of preparing for that very small chance of a disaster. Um, hurricanes are, 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 are very unlikely in most cases. Um, we had uh, a major hurricane like Ivan once every 25 years. But it happens. And we prepare for it. We have a department uh, um, uh, that, that is solely focused on hazard management. So we prepare for that. And we have to prepare for this regardless of how small the chance is. Because I know a lot of people saying, you, 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 um, you, like one of the callers said, you know, we can't assume that people haven't prepared for this or that, that their intelligence hasn't given them um, um, evidence or, or advice to say this could potentially come and have contingency plans. My job as a representative is to have contingency plans for my people. And I say that too because one of the next conversations is government has to now start preparing that if in fact something happens, not only the revenue, but the job potential loss is something that we also focus on. That means stringent um, policing over if there was, say, for instance, redundancies like what happened in the downturn in the economy in 2009, that those redundancies are not on Caymanians. That's something I want the government to listen carefully to because if they have to let people go as a result, if it's just a small amount, even if it's just one person, there's enough non Caymanians here to let them go first before any Caymanians. So let me make that clear. I think the government needs to start focusing on that from now because the last time around it was the Caymanians that went first and all the foreigners stayed on their work permit. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen under my watch. So I'll hold the government accountable for that. That being said, all I'm trying to suggest is that we prepare. And if, in fact, nothing happens, guess what? We have some new industries with new revenue coming in for extra things that we want to do because there's loads of things that to be done. So there's nothing wrong with preparing. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I do not want our persons to, to be in any more difficulties than they already are. Even if it's one Caymanian who loses a job, that Caymanian will probably lose their house the um, children's savings for education and all that. And one Caymanian suffering is too much for me. So we need to prepare. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. For those who may, because there's going to be politics in respect to this, for those who may think that I'm 
scaremongering. I'm preparing for the worst, and there's nothing wrong with that. That being said, OC and Miss Susan and all the staff here at Radio Cayman, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It's always a pleasure to be on, and I look forward to two weeks from now as we speak about the next topic, which is preparing Caymanians to take every single position in government at head decide and decision making position because we don't even have the option now even if we wanted to to go independent because you know why we're not prepared and that will be the next topic i'll be talking about come the two weeks wednesday from now so i thank you so much oc it's always a pleasure to speak to you okay thank you for the chance thank you for being here and i want to thank all, all of those who participated in the conversation this morning those of you who sent whatsapp messages as well and like i said uh those that really weren't topical uh this morning I will deal with them on uh, Friday as well. I think there's one that I have to do some research on. Uh, a person wanted to know in relation to Caymanians, Caymanian status holders, what is the hierarchy when it comes to uh, job priorities um, uh, when, when uh, someone is being considered for a job. Is it Caymanian first st status holders, next permanent residence or whatever? You're Caymanian regardless what they, of what Caymanian exactly, you are. Yeah. Caymanian but they want, to know, they want to know what the hierarchy is in terms of the um, selection process, who gets priority um, over home as well. Um, I also want to say that the person who called in about uh, the Canal Lane flooding situation, uh, they have sent me images of that, and I will share those with Mr. Brian as well so that he can see exactly what's happening there. And I think they have basically given us a timeline, showing us when <coughs> the area, when there's no rain, what it is like, and uh, when it rains, uh, you know, what it is like um, as well. And I want to thank you, our listening and viewing audience, for allowing Radio Cayman and, by extension, for the record, into your homes, into your vehicles as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands, into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. I also want to remind you that we are our brothers and our sisters' keepers. There is always someone out there who's less fortunate than we are, and I ask you to extend a helping hand to them. If you can't do that, then I suggest you donate to a worthy charity because we always want to consider those who need, not necessarily those who want or even those who crave. I say to you, have a great day. Continue to support your radio station, Radio Cayman. Join Sterling Dreamy Banks at 12 noon for talk today. And as usual, we ask the good Lord to bless these three beautiful, wonderful Cayman Islands. <laughs>